Impact measurement and management is practice is a key tenant of impact investing. What we found in the research is that it has matured and deepened, but as I mentioned earlier, there are still opportunities for refinement. Before we delve a little deeper, I want to point out two challenges noted by investors that su and suggest that within those lie key opportunities. The first is that respondents believe that areas in which the most progress has been made are in the areas of research on market activity, which is an essential tool for investors, especially new entrants, to understand the market, where and how to best focus their efforts. And secondly, in the sophistication of impact measurement and management. We'll share a little more on this later. The second issue is this. That over the next five years, investors are concerned about impact washing. Indeed, this is a challenge for the integrity of the industry. One of the strongest ways to address this, this concern is through the rigor of impact measurement and management practices a significant focus of the GIN and many others' work. The annual survey's third finding uncovers this a little further, and let's see how they do so. Firstly, they intentionally target specific impact returns. Nearly every single respondent targets social impact, about, um, about 94%. About six in 10 investors target both social and environmental impact. What this tells us is, is that most investors see social and environmental targets are interrelated. So given we know uh, what's happening with capital flows, um, and given we know where we need to get to, um, and the type of post-pandemic economy we're, we're looking to achieve, what are we seeing out in the marketplace now that is going to support this seismic shift needed? Um, I've quickly summarized 10, 10 areas that we are very excited about at, at, at Tribe. You know, first, and Dean's already alluded to this, is the shift in the accounting practices that are being supported by impact investors requiring better disclosure. The Impact Weighted Accounting Initiative, which Dean has mentioned over at Harvard and George Seraphim in partnership with the Impact Management Project and the Global Steering Group on Impact Investing, is a really good example of this. Uh, and we think this new age in accountancy will drive transparency and disclosure um, of the liabilities and the externalities associated uh, with those liabilities on balance sheet and it potentially heralds a new lens through which companies are valued. So we probably all saw, I think it was last week, Apple is now worth two trillion. When its natural and human capital liabilities are factored in, I can guarantee you that Apple is not worth two trillion dollars. So we need more honest, accurate and transparent reporting of the true cost of running a business and the true value of a business. And this is where impact investing can play a role in demanding these types of disclosures, much, very much like the conditions that have been set out for disclosure by the TCFD. Um, the second area is the shifts in the interpretation of fiduciary duty. So we've already seen the US Department of Labor announce regressive changes to how pension funds in the US should or in this case should not, engage with ESG funds. And this has catapulted them into a war of words and wills with some of the big institutional houses in the US, for example, State Street, who've publicly condemned this move, citing fiduciary duty as the reason why ESG matters. So we believe that fiduciary duty is set to take center stage over the next months and the next you know, few years. Within but you know, this is what financial returns mean to us. Uh, what uh, strategic or economic returns means and what societal returns mean. Like we, we can go back, but roughly, you know, essentially, as you know, you know, uh, I mean, if I use a specific example, a wafer fabrication plant in Malaysia and given where Malaysia was on its economic uh, development trajectory, it was very difficult to justify on pure financial terms. But when you start calculating input output tables, uh, on what it contributes, you know, in terms of multiplier effect, in terms of knowledge effects, in terms of employment effects, uh, then the, the numbers actually start changing quite quickly. But who's going to bear that, right? So I think in some ways, a sovereign fund can do this easier uh, in some ways than, than a, a, a non-sovereign fund, right? Which obviously you have fiduciary and other duties. But arguably, we had, we had, we had all of them too. And really, how do we find the balance and the trade-offs? I think the devil is indeed in the details. And societal and indeed the belief, uh, we are not of the camp that you know, we have to do everything, obviously. We pay taxes, by the way. Uh, you know, but we also created foundations. 
where we saw on the public service delivery side, for example, there was either a lack of willingness or a lack of capability or a lack of capacity on the government side. Uh, so if I take an example on, uh, you know, the, the every year in Malaysia, about 150,000 graduates from Malaysian universities couldn't get jobs. Uh, frankly, I think the, the whole system of government universities were producing jobs that were not quite market ready. So, so in other words, the base system wasn't quite producing that. That's obviously a public sector job. But we stepped in uh, and we tried to be proportionate about it. Uh, we can't solve the whole 100,000, but every year we would do about 15, 20,000. That's quite a lot of money to basically reskill and then use our networks with the market and the employment market to try and place these people out. 